Many thanks for that introduction, Christine, and to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak with you all today. As mentioned, I'm Gavin McIntyre. I'm one of the co-founders. I serve as the chief commercial officer at Ecubative, the mycelium technology company. Today, I look to share with you a bit on the background and development of Ecubative over the years, the technologies that we have developed and scaled and commercialized over the years, and why we do what we do, and principally, why we have focused on using Dutch-style button mushroom infrastructure in order to scale our new platform in air mycelium. Our journey began back in 2007 with an observation that we and our planet deserve better materials and proteins. The very first market that we targeted was the over 600 billion global plastics industry that even though it's only a century old is ubiquitous within our everyday lives. If you look around yourself right now, the chairs that you're sitting on, they have polyester fabric. They're using polyurethane for cushioning. The clothing that I'm wearing contains much of the same. But these materials are inherently based on finite resources. They're extractive and therefore not compatible with our planet. At the end of their useful life cycle, they do not passively return to the earth. And in their most egregious form, in single-use plastics, whose life cycle might last only a matter of days, they can subsist in our environment for years and years to come. Next, we focused in on the area of industrial agriculture for animal husbandry and cultivation. As our population increases, we're demanding more and more center of the plate proteins. And we've commonly gotten these from animal agriculture. These are industries that are in part responsible for deforestation, consume a tremendous portion of our arable land globally, and of course, our potable water which of course has its impact not only internationally, but here, even in Nevada, where we have water scarcity. And these particular industries demand these scarce resources that are important for our everyday lives. That's why we look to nature and principally one of our oldest industries and technologies in agriculture. We as humans have been domesticating new crops for tens of thousands of years. These are crops that we use throughout the world and have made incremental improvements through the green revolution and the introduction of chemistry, then incremental improvements into the new fields of biotechnology, increasing yields, demanding fewer resources, and then, but still producing the same products day in and day out. And for that reason, we at Ecovative believe that we need a new industrial, one that can be democratized, generally accessible and produced globally to meet the growing demand for new materials and proteins. And for that reason, we turn to mycelium. I think this is the first audience that I've ever spoken to where I actually don't need to define mycelium, which is great because it's core to all of our businesses, right? doesn't matter if you're in spawn or mushroom cultivation, which is just one morphological feature of mycelium. Mycelium is core to all of our businesses. And we have focused on mycelium principally because of its enzymatic diversity and its ability to take advantage of a wide range of different biomass resources. These can come from industry, forestry, and agriculture. They're non-food grade resources, so they don't compete with our food supply chains that we need, again, to continue to fuel our population. These are materials that are inherently uh, aligned with natural systems. There are the recycling system in nature. They're adept at taking leaf litter and coarse woody debris and transforming those into the mushrooms that you see out of the side of the tree. But mycelium also lends itself beautifully to industrial scale processes. Give this as a comparison to other types of life that we've scaled over the years. It's important to take a look at some of the unique attributes to mycelium that align with both individual single cell microbes and more complex life forms like animals. First, if we look at single cell organisms like yeast or bacteria, which we have leveraged for centuries to ferment everything from beer to pharmaceuticals. Bacteria and yeast are phenomenal producing small molecules, but they fail in assembling complex macroscopic structures that we can immediately use in our everyday lives to create anything from textiles to materials. That means that they require arduous, typically high embodied energy processes in order to create these materials, become expensive, and then of course, have an environmental impact that we're trying to work away from. 
Next, if we look up to the complexity of life to animals, which are amazing bioreactors, and we've been able to take advantage of everything from their muscle tissue for the meat that fuels us to, of course, to their skins, the challenge there is animals are always in the shape of animals, which once again requires a tremendous amount of processing, creates waste. When we look to mycelium, it has some unique attributes of common microbes. It grows exponentially. One of the other values, however, is its ability to create structures. As I mentioned, mushrooms are just one of those structures. But mycelium responds to its surrounding environment. And through this manipulation of the environment, the selection of strains, and the raw materials we use, we can create new categories of materials and food products based on the plasticity of mycelium. Today at Ecovative, we have served uh, several different verticals over the years. The first one that we introduced in 2009, which we generally call mycocomposites, and the first product there was mushroom packaging, is really a method of binding particles together with mycelium. Mycelium is serving as a natural adhesive or glue. This technology has been globally distributed and is currently produced on three continents in dozens of different locations, serving products from protective packaging to even coffins, which in essence are just packaging for humans at end of life. Next, our most recent technology platform, though we started in this field back in 2010, is in leather-like textiles and elastomeric foams where we have specifically selected mycelium strains that are incredibly tough and tenacious, resilient, strong, so that they can directly displace common plastics and leather that's currently out there in the fashion, apparel, and upholstery industries. Next, through our sister organization in My Forest Foods, we've been able to tap into delicious, well-known gourmet mushroom species like oyster mushrooms to create new center of the plate whole cut meat alternatives that can directly displace conventional meat products in the market today. We'll be serving that at five o'clock today too. So hopefully you can join us and you can try our My Bacon Strips. One of the other unique benefits for mycelium, which is core to us as an organization and our mission is that mycelium is inherently circular in both its production and end of life. Today, we have an open loop feedstock system. At Ecovative, we've qualified over 800 different biomass resources from around the world. This allows us to both be economically efficient, being nimble to select raw materials based on specific geographies or what type of market pressure is being put onto these different raw materials. And the mycelium, using its diverse enzymatic toolkit, can transform and valorize these waste streams into a new high-value product in just a matter of days using commonly found controlled vertical farming infrastructure, which we know as mushroom farms. At the end of those materials useful life cycle, they not only biodegrade, but they're fully compostable. If you put these into plant-based compost piles, they'll degrade passively in just 28 to 45 days, far faster than that of plastic. If they end up in an ocean, it's 180 days, all fitting within nat nature's existing systems. It wasn't sufficient for us to just look at biodegradability. We took a step further. We've taken the compost from these materials and have actually cultivated a new generation of, pro of crops, be it corn, soybeans, or even cucumbers. These are crops that not only nourish the population, but whose byproducts then replenish our cycle anew so that we can once again start cultivating the next generation of mycelium. I'd love to give you a brief history of Ecovative's journey over the last nearly 17 years. I was fortunate enough to found the company back in 2007 with Eben Bayer, our CEO, uh, who's in the audience today. Eben, can you just give a, give a wave there? Eben had the original insight that mycelium could be a natural and grown glue. This was really exciting. It was aligned with one of my passions in sustainability. And as two engineers without much experience in biology, we were the first to really start to characterize mycelium as a material and found its very first product application back in 2009 in protective packaging. Protective packaging is a phenomenal area for materials like these, once again, because they have a limited duration of use and at the end of their useful life cycle, they should passively return to the earth. 
in scaling our protective packaging product for the first time, this is where we got some really valuable insights on scale. The very first production line that we developed, which was a continuous pasteurization for raw materials, uh, which was unique in the industry and something that we've continued to scale. But we also developed a tray-based system from the ground up without looking to analogous industries. The first full-scale plant that we built in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, took more time and cost more than we had originally expected. And for that reason, as we've scaled air mycelium and have scaled out our mushroom packaging business, we've really focused on other fields, horticulture, to be able to demystify and make this more accessible broadly. During this time, we were also seeing how mycelium could fill gaps and voids within our mushroom packaging products. We were being asked for nicer surface finishes that had soft, velvety textures. And in this way, we started to manipulate the growth environment, induce the mycelium to grow on the outside. And in that way, we were able to discover that we could grow mycelium many inches in thickness from the same bed of raw materials that we use in the packaging. With support from the Environmental Protection Agency back in 2011, we started a research program focusing on creating new elastomeric foams, principally for the footwear industry. This was a long journey for us, namely because we had infrastructure that was relatively large scale, so it limited the amount of research or the number of experiments we could do on a weekly or annual basis. For that reason, 2018, our team invested in what we call the Mycelium Foundry, first of its kind, unique toolkit that allows us to rapidly develop new strains, raw materials, and growth recipes to create new classifications of materials and products. This is also where conventional mushroom farming infrastructure came in. When we were looking at how we could scale this beyond the constraints that we saw within the protective packaging industry, we landed on Dutch style vertical farming infrastructure for button mushrooms. In 2020, we first invested in this infrastructure and by early 2021, we were growing aerial mycelium at scale and transforming that into our first product using gourmet oyster mushroom mycelium, which is my bacon. The early success and launch of my bacon in just one store, showing that the sales velocity and that sewers were coming back for a great tasting, great texture, differentiated product, led us to invest further in our first full scale farm, which is located in upstate New York. This demonstration has allowed us to partner with other farms internationally to bring this into their existing infrastructure and to start cultivating our aerial mycelium based products and has allowed us some additional flexibility to think about what's next. And for that, we turn back to our original basics, which in this way was trying to find, dis uh, find alternatives and to displace plastics in the apparel and upholstery industries. We further developed our forager foams and textiles. And this is a product that's still under development, but is expected to be commercially available later this year. Now let's take a look at the mycelium landscape because it truly is burgeoning, just like Chris said earlier. This is a great graphic that was put together by Myco Stories. I won't say that it's fully exhaustive. So if you don't see your name on this list, I'm sorry, please reach out to Mark. Uh, but I think what is really important here, even though it's in this top corner, is of course all of you, those within the mushroom cultivation industry. And even though you're squeezed into this small corner, you're the biggest industry here. You're growing nutritious and delicious mushrooms every single day at a global scale. And that is what mycelium technologies aspire to do. And via Ecovative, we seek to do that within the same type of infrastructure. As an early pioneer in solid state fermentation and mycelium technologies, you'll see that Ecovative is really represented across different categories and verticals. Of course, we talked about food and leather-like textiles. And of course, Ecovative has its own seed business producing spawn, both for our products and others. If you zoom in closer into the category of material science, you'll see that our reach is extended, both through our licensees and partners who grow a range of different products, be it coffins, interior components like light fixtures, acoustic panels, and things of the like. Even parties like uh, Mycelium Materials Europa, who we heard from yesterday, grow our forager materials uh, today using Ecovative technology and a strain that we isolated from state New York. This has allowed us to extend our reach globally. 
And today, between Ecovative and our partners, we're growing literal tons of mycelium-based products every single week. Of course, Ecovative operates its own full-scale farm in upstate New York. And more recently, over the last couple of years, we've worked with Whitecrest Mushroom Farms in Putnam, Ontario, to pilot and now fully convert their farm over into growing our gourmet oyster mushroom mycelium for our My Forest Foods product, which they'll begin commercially producing in just a couple of months. Across the world and across three different continents, our mycocomposite products have been making an impact for over a decade now, growing a diversity of products from protective packaging to interior components and beyond. But let's talk about how we're domesticating a new crop for the 21st century. And we truly believe this might be the first new crop in the last century that's getting scaled and coming to market. And we're doing this and we intentionally selected a buttons mushroom style infrastructure to cultivate a new higher value product that grows exceedingly fast and is farm ready. So let's take a look at what it looks like in the growth process. This is a time-lapse video from our farm in upstate New York. This is growing our my bacon mycelium right here. What you see is conventional uh, Dutch style farm room. This room here has 1.6 meter wide shelves by nearly 30 meters in length. The mycelium over the course of just 12 to 13 days grows upwards of 120 millimeters or nearly four inches in total thickness. At the end of that growth process, there's very limited post-processing required. It literally gets harvested using automated equipment that we've developed and is then ready for the next downstream processing step, which in essence is brining and packaging. Now, Ecovative has experience in lots of different fields in mycelium. We've explored liquid fermentation avenues. And of course, our protective packaging system is a tray-based system today. So we're very familiar with both the deficiencies and the challenges with these when you're looking to create new mycelium-based products. If we look at tray-based systems, these are tend to be of bespoke design. They're not common in the marketplace today, and they're very capital intensive. They don't need to be reliant upon food-grade resources, but they are not widely available, and it's something that has to be really developed from the ground up. If we look at liquid fermentation, which has been around for centuries, Liquid fermentation has a very expensive infrastructure, large stainless steel vessels. And when you cultivate mycelium in uh, submerged fermentation, you lose the material and mechanical benefits that come from mycelium because you no longer have control over its physical properties structure. Similarly, there's a lot of competition out there for this principal infrastructure. Those that for ferment products have many choices to make. They could ferment mycelium, but they could also ferment things like pharmaceuticals, which command far more value. For that reason, we look to mushroom cultivation as really our North Star in scaling our mycelium technologies. The reason being is that there are billions of pounds of capacity already out there globally. We could go to any market here in Las Vegas and find one of your delicious mushroom pro products on the shelves, and it's simply dollars per kilogram economically viable, and demonstrates operational efficiencies. So when developing a new industrial crop, even if it does and can fit into existing infrastructure, there are several tacks that we have taken in order to mitigate risk in scaling and make sure that this is really accessible to the general farming community. The first in new materials development is what we call our mycelium foundry. So if we look at liquid fermentation, which has the benefit of scaled down infrastructure, there are lots of opportunities and avenues to do high throughput research, developing new media types, new incubation conditions, and of course, new strains. That frankly did not exist in solid state fermentation, which is the field in which Ecovative works in, and of course, mushroom cultivation is solid state fermentation. So we've had to invest in new infrastructure in order to create a paradigm for high throughput research. Next is in raw material control. The spawn, or the super seeds as we call them, are really critical or paramount to product quality and success. If you have a challenge with your product, you're probably gonna turn to your spawn supplier first and foremost. And for us in scaling this new technology, we decided to invest in our own infrastructure 
for spawn production to ensure that we can maintain control over the quality, as well as be able to quickly adapt our new strains that we've developed into a scalable process that can then go to our farms and to our partners' locations around the world. And then finally, we do focus on integrating into existing mushroom farm infrastructure. We typically blur out the names of the equipment because the general audience doesn't know that green and gold in this industry uh, is not John Deere. So let's dive into our mycelium foundry and talk a little bit about what some of its capabilities are and how we've leveraged it already in the last couple of years in order to develop and accelerate new products into the marketplace. So first, as I mentioned, mycelium grows in response to its surrounding environment. These are key parameters that you might think of like temperature and humidity as an example. Uh, and we have developed these small growth rooms or growth chambers, if you will, that allow us to interrogate and design new growth recipes by modulating lots of different environmental conditions. Similar to mushroom cultivation, the growth and response of aerial mycelium isn't dependent upon one individual parameter. And oftentimes, these are interrelated factors that have to be examined and studied. By developing new recipes at this scale, we can directly translate those to our larger scale formats at pilot and full commercial scale. In essence, providing software updates to the farm in order to enhance product quality and yield. Next is strain development. Today, we use both commercially available strains to produce our products, as well as our own workhorse strains that have been selected for growth kinetics, uh, mechanical performance, structure, things like texture, flavor, color. These strains are ones that we have isolated ourselves. We have a vast strain library of over 600 individuals, all selected for unique features. We have other solid state fermentation technology that has allowed us to scale it down further. And today, as I speak to you today, our team in New York is bioprospecting 50 new species for mechanical performance for the next generation of forager products. Some already have demonstrated the ability to enhance properties like tensile strength by more than 2x of the current strain that we're growing and cultivating today. Next is our substrate development. Substrate development is key both for our ability to reach scale internationally, as well as to ensure the economic viability of these products. We have assessed and in our library have over 800 different biomass resources that we can draw from. By working within our scaled down systems, we can break down these raw materials into their constituent parts to really understand what each individual mycelium strain and species needs in order to grow and create the same consistent product day in and day out. By breaking it down into its key constituent parts, that allows us to open up the field of different raw materials we can use. And it has enabled us to source raw materials typically within just a few hundred kilometers of the farms in which these materials are grown today. The hardware alone is not sufficient though to enhance and to move forward our development. We have paired this with large data. As a technology-based organization, we have a nearly 17 year history of capturing data. We have paired these data from all scales of our system, from as small as a mailbox to as large as a full scale commercial farm to both enable us to move quickly in scaling as well as to identify challenges and to bring those back to the lab bench to address quickly. The key here is that through these features, we're able to take data from all of these systems day in and day out across over 26,000 individual records, analyzing and qualifying lots of different growth recipes, all within an individual year time. Being able to target key performance attributes that we're looking at that have these huge interrelated matrices of variables and narrow those in to ones that really matter for, for us to focus on based on our back data. We capture these data at our farm and through our partnership network, look to capture uh, data from them as well so that we can continue to make improvements and push updates without infrastructure requirements and truly just software updates. Similarly, we've taken a very conscientious approach to scale. What we've learned over the years is that if something works at the lab bench, it's not guaranteed to work at ultimate farm scale. The reason being is that thermodynamic considerations are frankly just different. And for that reason, we take individual magnitude leaps 
through our pipeline of scaling infrastructure at Ecubata. This allows us to identify challenges at one scale, bring it back to the lab bench, identify how we can resolve that issue quickly, and then push it back up through our scale chain. And that way we go from an individual kilogram to tens of kilograms to hundreds of kilograms to ultimately the tons that we're producing today. And this is really supported by over 10 years of product development and over 80 patent families that are issued and pending worldwide. Now it's important when we think of a new technology to both look back, honor, and respect the great technological improvements that the mushroom cultivation industry has, has uh, come along in its journey. Learnings that we look to garner in our journey as well and adapt. Mushroom cultivation, even in the last century, has made incredible improvements in operational efficiency and yield, and still relies today predominantly on what I would call growers' intuition. It's these wise individuals that have generations of experience that can go into the rooms and they can interrogate the growth and they know what type of course corrections to make. In mycelium, in a new field like the one that we're in today, that frankly doesn't exist. And so we have to augment that with the background and technology that we have and the big data that we continue to analyze to support individuals like Adam. Many of you may know Adam Hines. He used to work at Penn State University. He was in the mushroom cultivation industry for years. And we're really honored to have Adam on our team as our general manager at our farm to bring both that knowledge and wisdom from the mushroom cultivation industry. But that grower's intuition is not always pertinent to the, uh, to the production of aerial mycelium. And so that way, our foundry team supports Adam and his endeavors to scale out, uh, scale up and scale out to parties like Whitecrest Mushrooms in Putnam, Ontario. So let's take a look at Adam's farm so I can give you a real insight in terms of how these materials are produced today. First, in our North American Ecubative Spawn and Substrate plant, we have developed a continuous pasteurization system that allows us to take and mix a number of different biomass resources, steam pasteurize those at a rate of eight to 10 tons per hour, we then individually bag those materials to ensure process quality along the way. They can be individually inspected. And that starts what we call a pre-colonization process. This spans just a couple of days. And what that enables the mycelium to do is really to have a founder's effect. It colonizes the substrate and becomes robust to contamination, such that when those bags are opened and get integrated into the full farm scale, we really mitigate the opportunities for contaminant. Doesn't say we don't get contamination, but it does limit our total risk on that. This is a highly automated process, as you can see here. And we have currently are focusing on production of our oyster mushroom products today. This is where the conventional mushroom farming infrastructure comes in. Those bags are opened. They're dumped into large blue bulk bins. And then the balance of the equipment may look really familiar to some of you. So it gets loaded into hoppers. Those hoppers go into conveyors and those conveyors go into traditional head fillers. Those head fillers fill rooms just like any other head filler does for the, convert, for the button mushroom industry. There are some modifications that we've made to these rooms, though I think generally this infrastructure is going to look very familiar to you all. The first one is that we don't have to manually pick our products. We've developed infrastructure to automatically harvest these materials so that they're ready for the next downstream process step. That means that instead of seven to eight shelves, we can get 12 shelves, really optimizing the total surface area and volumetric footprint of that space. Next, mycelium is really regulated not just by conventional conditions that are used in the mushroom cultivations. We've developed some of our own unique sensors and have created controlled feedback loops that allow us to control and regulate the growth of the mycelium over its 7 to 13 day incubation cycle, depending on the type of product that we're producing. Then, of course, at the end of its cultivation cycle, it's ready to harvest. This is where the balance of new infrastructure comes in. We have a phenomenal design build team at Ecovative which can rapidly prototype new full-scale infrastructure that we can deploy 
either at our pilot or full-scale farm. Demonstrate its key features, sub-assemblies and the like to ensure that they operate at full scale. And then we partner with industry leaders to really formalize and then distribute those technologies to other parties like Whitecrest. This video here really shows key differentiation within the texture of our aerial mycelium. That's the texture that's core to our products. What creates this, the structure that enables us to produce materials across the fields of plastics and of course into food. So in unlocking scale up, mention the importance of raw materials and the control over the individual strains that we select through our bioprospecting and then of course our scale journey. We work with industry leaders within the field in order to take not only off the shelf equipment, but to develop and refine new technology that once again seamlessly integrates into the global farming infrastructure. And today, I'm glad to dive into some of the product categories that we presently serve. First up is My Bacon and our sister company, My Forest Foods. Back in 2018, we were seeing a tremendous amount of growth within the alternative protein space. This is a space that button mushrooms and other mushrooms have served for a long time now. The majority of these products, however, were extruded. They were based on soy protein or wheat common allergens that really limit market. But because they're extruded, they also fell flat on texture. Texture is the key differentiator for whole muscle or whole cut products like steak or bacon. This is really where mushrooms come into play. We all know well that there are many mushrooms out there that are known for their meat-like textures. So much so they're aptly named things like chicken or hen of the woods or the beef tongue polypore, right? Of course, they're always grown in the shape of mushrooms, but that's where Ecubative's technology came in to unlock that geometry and of course to bring scale. This was also the very first time we put our foundry into use. Over the course of just 18 months, we went through individual species, selected strains, and then developed the substrate and growth recipe for our first generation My Forest and My Bacon product. That led us to scaling that up for the first time in 2021. And this is a product today that is in regional distribution throughout the American Northeast. So what's different about My Bacon in comparison to other bacon products? Well, one, you'll get to try it for yourself. And I think that you'll be surprised by both the flavor and the texture that it delivers. First and foremost, the consumer was demanding a product that was really a whole food and really easy to understand. Our My Bacon product today only has six simple ingredients. The primary one is oyster mushroom mycelium, followed by organic coconut oil, which allows you to fry it directly out of the pack. Organic uh, cane sugar, sea salt, natural flavors, and then finally some extract that's all organic. And this is an organic certified product. People love the culinary experience because it's exactly what they expect from a conventional bacon product. But at the end of the cooking process, you're just left with a well-seasoned pan rather than a massive mess to clean up. And the consumer response to this product has been phenomenal. Some say they can't tell the difference between this and conventional bacon but they always describe how wonderful the flavor and texture of the product is. And this has been demonstrated now time and time again through the tremendous sales velocity we've seen in the early retailers that we've introduced the product into, where it's been outselling not only conventional bacon, but also plant-based bacons, some instances as much as seven times the conventional product that's on the shelf today. Next, even though we've been working on this for well over a decade, is our new family of products that we call Forager. Forager is really positioned to displace the elastomeric foams that you would find in apparel or in seating applications, as well as creating an intermediate that could go directly into tanneries to create leather-like articles that are fit for fashion. There were some questions yesterday about the material properties of forager and mycelium materials, generally speaking. And there are some really amazing attributes to this in comparison to conventional plastics, because in this industry, you have to both perform on a mechanical basis and on an economic basis. These are materials that are highly resilient. They can take an impact, rebound, 
keep on going. Because mycelium has a naturally open cell structure, it's breathable, unlike many conventional plastics. It allows for air and water vapor permeation to come through. But because it's also a closed cell structure, it's also naturally insulating, better than that of expanded polystyrene or several common uh, insulators that are on the market today. And then when we look at mechanical properties, which are core these types of material applications, and you compare it to densities of polyurethane foams that are the same, these materials outperform those foams. The tensile strength of our highest density mycelium that we cultivate today, which is about 32 kilograms per meter cubed, is in excess of 100 kilopascals, which is about 20% greater than the equivalent density polyurethane foams today. Next, we look to, once again, leverage institutional knowledge in several spaces. The first is within the leather tanning industry. The leather tanning industry has been getting pressure for material alternatives because their product, even though a byproduct of the meat industry, is animal derived. And they're completely locked out of the alternatives, which today are conventionally plastics. Some may have botanical fibers, but they're still predominantly plastic based. Leveraging this institutional knowledge and centuries of wisdom in taking what is a byproduct and transforming it into a beautiful article, we've worked with tanneries like Echo Leather, which is based in the Netherlands, as well as in Asia, demonstrate that these materials following point of harvest can go directly into conventional tanning infrastructure. There's no additional capital equipment required, nothing new or special. Getting the full range of colors and textures that are commonplace within conventional leather products, but also the performance. Being able to exceed 10 megapascals in tensile strength. Being able to take rubs in exposure to moisture and perspiration without losing performance or their color aesthetics. Critically important. Now there's still more to this journey that has to come. We're still developing this product. Looking at ways of increasing certain performance attributes that are still deficient in comparison or bioprospecting new strains that could exceed the performance attributes of our core workhorse dog today. But along this ride, we have great partners, well-recognized brands that have already been taking these materials and transforming those into products that you'd recognize from small leather goods, such as wallets and handbags, to upholstery that's been used in dune buggies for Myers Manx, and of course, into footwear, which we all use and wear on a daily basis. These are well-known brands that have continued to pilot and will be launching products over the coming years with the forager materials as we continue on our mission to displace plastics. So with that, hope this was helpful in terms of deciphering and demystifying some of the mycelium technology. And I welcome you all to come farm with us for a new crop for the 21st century. Thank you.